All right, happy Thursday, all you optimal performers. I'm your host, Ryan Muncie. I want to welcome you to another episode of the Optimal Performance Podcast. We have a very special guest for you today, Dr. Russell Jaffe. Dr. Jaffe is a man with over 40 years of experience in the fields of nutrition, integrative and functional medicine. And we're going to talk about some predictive biomarkers for lifetime health today. This is going to be a really fascinating episode, so sit back and enjoy this one. So, Dr. Jaffe, let's get into what we want to share today. Predictive biomarkers for lifetime health. That's the title of the presentation that you gave last week at Silicon Valley Health Institute. Uh, I reached out to you because I was not able to get to that uh, physically, and you've been gracious enough to agree to share some of that with us here on the Optimal Performance Podcast today. So thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing this stuff with us. All right. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Well, yes, there are ways of adding life to years and years to life. That's what we want to do. That's very well said. So I think we all want to do that. We want to do that for ourselves, for our children, for our parents. And it turns out while there are 100,000 clinical lab tests that can be done, and probably another 50 to 100,000 that are in research development as we speak, because information keeps you know, exponentially expanding. Um, but there are eight, just eight, eight tests. And when you know those, the values for those eight tests and their goal values, because we want people to understand that in the past, you became a statistic, but today you're an individual. We want personalized healthcare. We want primary proactive prevention. Personally, the way I say this is I'm planning to be dancing at 120 and I want you to be with me. Well, I hope you are and I hope we can all be doing the same. Well, my principal teacher was dancing at 112, and then wow. something happened. But there are, there are examples, there really are examples, that if we're willing to have a certain amount of self-discipline and a certain amount of self-understanding, um, and I, I don't know if you know who Sting is, but he's a performer, and he, he's a, he, I think he's a few years older than I, but we're about the same age, and he looks terrific. Uh, and he was interviewed on some show, it might have been The Daily Show or Stephen Colbert, and the question was, how come? What, what, what is your secret? <laughs> and he said, he said, 50% self-discipline and 50% vanity. <laughs> and I thought, yes, I want to walk my talk to the point where people say, gee, doc, you look so good, what do you do? <laughs> right. Right. And right now, as you know, I am on the West Coast, and it was a privilege to talk to Silicon Valley Health Institute. And yesterday, we gave an all-day workshop, an intensive one for colleagues uh, at, a, at a venue here in the Bay Area. And Tuesday night, uh, I'll be the uh, uh, the uh, content or the speaker for the Commonwealth Club, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a privilege that I uh, am uh, fortunate to have. And the same message is, you can save your life or you can put your life in the hands of others. In the past, we more or less had to put our hands in the life of others, doctors, licensed health professionals, because they had the information and we didn't. Guess what? The internet has been invented. <laughs> Guess what? The second, I think this is true, the second most popular topic on the internet is about nutrition, lifestyle, and being healthy. And our contribution is what are the tests that cover the things that you can influence, what's called epigenetic or lifestyle. And that turns out to be 92% of lifetime health, so it's not insignificant, it's very significant. And yes, genes are important, picking your parents you know, wisely is very important, but that's only 8%, 8% of lifetime health. So I'm not gonna be talking today about these new genetic tests but I am going to be talking about the epigenetic territory, the 92% you can influence. And if you want, we could just go through those tests. You know, what are the eight tests? What do they cover? What are their goal values? Uh, we can do all of that. Now, by the way, it would help to have someone who's done this before work with you if you're just mo moving into this territory of, um, I'll be my own doctor as best I can until I need someone else to help me. Um, I want to work with a virtual or real health coach or personal uh, advisor, someone who 
um, can lift the information uh, out of the abstract uh, and ground it uh, for each person. Mm -hmm. So yes, we can go through the headlines, and I'm really happy to do that, and in some detail. And it doesn't take all that long. But please understand, this is the appetizer. This is not you know, the entree. <laughs> so for people listening, as we go through this, if they want to pursue uh, you know, these tests, what kind of recommendation would you have for them to locate either in close proximity so that they can physically visit this doctor or work virtually with somebody who's experienced in these areas? Well, right. There are basically two pathways. One is you work through a health professional and the other is you work through a direct access online resource. Uh, if you wish to work through a health professional, uh, both my immunology lab uh, and our Perk Integrative Health Center maintain a national list by zip code mm -hmm. of health professionals. And there are two toll-free numbers, which I'd be happy to give. Uh, the first of the toll-free numbers, so grab a pencil if you're interested. The first of the toll-free numbers is 1-800-553-5472. That's 1-800-553-5472 or 1-800-553-SERA, like Sarah Immune Physicians Lab. And the other, another toll-free number, 1-800-525-5472. 7372. 1 800 525 And the uh, customer service people there are just waiting for a call. They would be happy to help connect you with the physician closest to you that we've been able to train or certify. If you guys are and driving. Then the other, yeah, yes, just, then just, the other side, if you want direct access, it's www.betterlabtestsnow.com. So it's www.betterlabtests.com, betterlabtests.com. And that's a direct consumer access, and you have the option of having the results interpreted through them to best outcome goal value. Okay. And if you wish, although there's an additional charge, there is a health coach that can consult with you uh, for 15, 30, 45 minutes, depending on uh, uh, how much you would like. Uh, and that's an option, but not a necessity. Uh, but this is one of the direct access lab resources, but one that specializes in the best outcome goal value and an interpretation of how to get there. Okay. So for anybody listening, if you happen to be driving or, or working out or listening in, in a way that you weren't able to write that down, make sure you go to naturalstacks.com, see the blog version of this. We'll have those um, phone numbers and websites linked so that you can grab them and get any resources that you need. Uh, so, Thank you. Yeah, of course. Dr. Jaffe, let's, let's jump right in. What are these eight tests? Why are they so important? Right, right. Well, let, let's start at the high level, mm -hmm. epigenetics, what we can influence, not the genetic DNA in our nucleus, but how that expresses itself in our lives. And the first, and something people are often very familiar with, is we want to know how efficiently your blood sugar is maintained and converted from sugar into energy because our brain runs on sugar and glucose. Many of our cells benefit from a small but steady amount of sugar, but too little is really too little, and too much is really too much. And we used to measure glucose tolerance, and we used to measure blood sugar and insulin ratios, and we used to do things like HOMA analyses, and it was kind of complicated. But what you really need to know, and the only test in my opinion today, that clinically you need have, to have is the hemoglobin A1C. And this test qualifies as a predictive biomarker, and that's our category, predictive biomarkers. Mm -hmm. A biomarker is a test that has meaning, but a predictive one has a value that we can guide therapy around. And these high sensitivity predictive biomarkers cover this epigenetic territory. So the first is hemoglobin A1C, and it's about how efficiently your body takes in and regulates sugar and converts it to energy. And what we're specifically measuring is extra sugar stuck onto the hemoglobin molecule. And that occurs when the average, average blood sugar is too high. And you want your average blood sugar to be just right, not too much, not too little. If you remember the Goldilocks story, 
Every one of these tests has a Goldilocks value. That's the goal value, the best outcome value. Okay, so number one is this hemoglobin A1C, and it's about converting sugar into energy, but it's also about regulating uh, the available sugar uh, within your metabolic uh, capacity. Um, and I'd like to go through the eight tests and then come back to the eight tests and their goal values, if that's okay. Yeah. So what are, we, what are we measuring, and then what's the best outcome? Okay. So the second test, the second test, is another one that people may have had measured, but we're going to rethink what it means and how to interpret it, and that's the C-reactive protein, the CRP. And, and we want the high sensitivity version. In fact, in all of these tests, if there's a high sensitivity version available, we want that. It means more precision in the analysis and uh, more um, accuracy in interpretation. So we want the HSCRP. It's generally available, sometimes called cardiac CRP, but it's not specific for the heart or blood vessels. It's an all-cause morbidity mortality uh, measure, and indeed, each of the ones that I will be proposing, each of the eight, covers an aspect, a slice of the pie, if you will, mm -hmm. of the total health that we can influence, the epigenetics. So the second is this HSCRP, um, and it's generally available in many labs, uh, but you want to use a consistent lab if you're going to measure a single test over time, because when you go between labs, even for the same test, they may use a different method or a different machine, and then it becomes hard to compare values. So that's a nuance uh, for those of you who are really into uh, the particulars. The third test, another venerable test, but one that deserves to be included, is homocysteine, plasma homocysteine, also known as HCY. That's the abbreviation for homocysteine. Um, this is not a political statement. This is a chemical called homocysteine. Um, and it is a measure, uh, if it's too high, then your methylation isn't working properly, you won't be repairing your blood vessels or your heart, and you have an increased risk of heart attack and stroke, you have an increased risk of atherosclerosis, but you also have an increased risk of suffering with chronic disease and, uh, and passing away early. Before so we, we want the homocysteine to be at its uh, best value. Before we move on, can you explain methylation and, and what that means for, for some of our listeners? Yes, methylation means that when you want to move something around in the body, you have to either add methyl groups so that it's more soluble. So more methyl means more soluble and more easily moved. So let's say we start in the nucleus, we send a signal to the uh, machinery of the cell to produce uh, collagen or produce some molecule, and now we have to move it to where we need it because, and, and this is I think a reasonable analogy, where you produce something is not where you use it and you need to transport it. Well, methylation, it's more than that, but it's uh, largely about, trans, about translation and transportation. So if you want to make something more easily movable, you methylate it, and if you want to put it in place, you demethylate it. Okay. And people have been a little confused about this because sometimes they talk about uh, enhanced methylation or reduced methylation. No, no, it's a physiologic function, folks. <laughs> if you want to move something around, you have to make it more soluble. If you want to keep it in place, you have to make it less soluble. Well, I know thus, with thus is thus is methylation. In, in you know, that's by analogy, folks. Right. Please don't tell me you technically say this, but it's accurate. It's accurate. It's right. accurate. And and we hear a lot with like things like 23andMe and and, and a lot of these genetic testing organizations where people are starting to learn more about their genetics and how it may affect their epigenetics. You know, we hear if, if, you, if you enjoy this interview, we could do a whole interview on that separate subject because <laughs> with due respect to 23andMe, Theranos, and other companies, and I really do have respect for the people and I have respect for what they're trying to do, but I would like to explain as a scientist and physician the limitations that they would agree to if you really press them, but their marketing people don't want to t communicate. Right. What a surprise, what a surprise that the marketing people want to tell you about the blue sky and the, and the sun that's rising in your back, and I want to tell you that it might be raining. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's another subject for another time, but it's worth talking about it, because the fact that you are different can make you unique. Right. And when we measure genetic differences, the assumption today is, oh, 
if I'm different, I must be defective. No. So that's the headline right. uh, of another discussion. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for asking because it's a really important point. And many people are specifically having them, their MTHFR as a specific mm -hmm. right. methylation uh, control center. But it turns out there are 40 other genes that uh, are interdependent uh, with that. And so that's another uh, kind of headline uh, teaser, if you will, yeah. uh, for the other for the other podcast. So, but, but if it's okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's that's exactly why I, I brought that question up because you hear the the MTFR, you know, uh, there, there's a joke about that, and and you know the, uh, uh, the the word that would get your mouth washed out with soap that it resembles, um, right? And uh, you hear under and over methylation. Uh, quite a bit. That's kind of a buzzword. So that's why I wanted to, you know, one, clarify, you know, what methylation is. But, you know, I also want to clarify, are you saying that it's, it's more important for, for us to check out the biomarker, you know, homocysteine, as opposed to the methylation? Oh, boy, you got it. So the predictive biomarkers we're talking about cover the 92% that's epigenetic. Yes, 8% is genetic. And yes, if you have a variant, I am glad to know about it. But I can tell you that buzzing is fine for bees and buzzwords are fine for marketing. But almost always, the buzzword has a hindsight, you know, or a hindsight. It has a shadow side that they don't want to talk about, which means limited understanding of the meaning of the result. Now, are they getting a result? Yes. Now, would they get the same result on two specimens from the same person at the same time? That's called a split sample. In my immunology lab, we've just reported at the experimental biology meeting this year at uh, San Diego that over four years and over 4,300 split samples representing 120,000 cell cultures and blah, 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 our precision, our split sample precision was less than 3% variance. If you look at 23andMe or Theranos, their variance on the best day they can is plus or minus 20%. Because they're doing a very uh, interesting uh, amplification technique. You know, they're picking up a little signal and amplifying it a lot. But one of the things that happens when you pick up a little signal and amplifying a lot is there's a wobble in the data. There's oscillation. Uh, in your Gaussian distribution, as they say, what, what it comes down to is uh, that uh, I very rarely encourage people to do these genetic, quote, simple tests. And in the rare case, you can today, and I will tell you how much it costs in a minute, but you can today do a meaningful, complete measure of your genome and your RNA. So you need both the DNA and the RNA today. And if we jump to the conclusion, uh, you can spend a mere five to ten thousand dollars, and I say mere because last year it was twenty to fifty thousand dollars, and the year before that it was a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. So it's getting less expensive quickly to get a meaningful, more complete, and functional measure of what's going on in your nucleus and in your genetic material. But these, but these twenty-three and me and these quick and dirty snips and snaps, I don't encourage them. And I usually find that people misunderstand that the fact that their face and fingerprints are unique just makes them them. But that doesn't mean they have a problem. And it certainly doesn't mean they need a pharmacologic yet uh, natural, a synthetic folate, for example, solution, when from my point of view, nature, nurture, and wholeness are principles. And so we do use natural folates because there's eight different forms of folate. And why? Because nature makes it that way. And we can have a whole podcast on all the different forms of folate and how important they are in methylation. And then we'll get into 20 or 30 different molecules if you want. <laughs> we, I'm a biochemist. We can go there. <laughs> I, I think we should go there, but maybe, like you said, on a different Not, podcast. No, 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 no. I want to get through these predictive biomarkers yeah. just like we promised these people. Yes. Let's. All right. So so let's use that as, a, as an excuse to jump to the next one. Yeah. We're, we're looking at yes. uh, oxidative yes, yes. stress. So we went through three that are familiar. Now I'm going to add the fourth which is something that, for full disclosure, my lab developed, but it's the lymphocyte response assay, immune tolerance. What can you eat? What medicines can you receive? What environmental chemicals are you tolerant to? Those things you're tolerant to, you can get exposed to, and your body says thanks. 
the things that you react against, that you're intolerant to, those are burdens on your immune system. Those are stresses on your hormonal system and your neurochemical system and stresses on your digestion and your mood and your sleep. And I could go on. Why? Because I've been at this a long time. Is, that, no, is um, this similar to like uh, getting an ALCAT test? Well, same category, but completely different. Okay. So ALCAT measures particles mm -hmm. of a certain size, mm -hmm. and then they make an assumption okay. that everything at that size is an activated lymphocyte. And then there's another problem. It's a technical problem because when people send them blind split samples, they don't agree with, with themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my lab, on the worst day, we're less than 3%. And on the best days, we're about 2.2, 2.3%. Okay. So the good news is that we're very consistent, very reproducible. We encourage people to send us blind split samples because we knock their socks off in terms of how accurate we are and the contrast. And it really is an opposite with regard to particle size or ALCAT kinds of tests. Right. And this is a functional lymphocyte response assay. So we are in an ex vivo way. So we're measuring something that happens in the body just as it happens in the body. Mm -hmm. That's the best kind of cell culture. So we don't have to isolate the lymphocytes and resuspend them and take many steps. And how do you get less than 3% variance in a lab test? It has to be a one step test. Okay. So we collapsed, mm -hmm. collapsed five steps into one. That was one of our, uh, our patents. Uh, then we figured out how to do both a cell culture and an amplified procedure. That's why it's ELISA ACT. That's a certain type mm -hmm. of LRA or a certain type of lymphocyte response. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing is we're measuring what your immune defense and repair system is tolerant to and what your immune system reacts against and is burdened by. And what we say is very simple. You may have the things you're tolerant to, you need to substitute. Substitute. It's a window of opportunity to uh, evoke healing responses and remove obstacles to recovery. It's not a lifetime of deprivation. A lot of people don't want to know if they're allergic to something because they were told somewhere along the way that if you're reactive, you're reactive for life and you have to just keep dropping things out until there's nothing left and then you go away. No, no. Restore tolerance. Right. It can be done. Now, it can't be done pharmacologically, but it can be done physiologically. And we've been doing it for decades. And, and I hope I'm clear that I'm talking about most, and I would say almost all, but never talking about all cases. So there are cases that have to consult the doctor. And if they or the doctor want to consult me, I'm a doctor. And I run the operation for a very simple reason. I ran the National Institutes of Health Labs at the clinical center, and they taught me well <laughs> how to do things properly. And we do, I believe, with impeccable uh, attention to detail. You can talk to my people. <laughs> uh, our attention to detail, impeccable, is, is, is about as bad as we get. Yeah. Why? Because this could be your specimen, and every specimen, I, every specimen I, and deserves I think... attention. Yeah, and I think we're we're getting a little bit of insight right now into uh, part of your reputation in, in is that you know even though you are a a clinically trained uh, you know in the medical world that I don't want to say you you disagree with uh, medicine as it is now but but you definitely have this uh, you lean more towards being proactive and 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 you know our medical industry now is set up for for sick care uh, as opposed to... I, I agree with that. Senator Tom Harkin is the first person I heard talking about the fact that America had a great sick care system, but we were looking for a health care system. And I will say that having been fortunate to have been trained at Boston University in Boston, to have been on the staff and then the permanent senior staff of NIH and interacted with almost every institute each year we were fortunate to be able to contribute a gold standard reference method in a different aspect of laboratory science. So I'm cross-trained, and then I was cross-trained in TCM, Chinese medicine, then cross-trained with Dr. Mishra in yoga sciences, and then I was really kind of polished by a guy named Bhante Dharmawara, who was a Cambodian Buddhist monk. Um, so I'm eclectic, and I believe that if we go back and venerate Hippocrates, if we believe that Galen and Maimonides and Paracelsus and how about Osler and some of the giants that walked in the 20th century, like Rene Dubose 
uh, who, uh, these, the next few people are mentors of mine, uh, including Albert Sins Georgie uh, and Jonas Salk. Uh, now, we among scientists almost never agree on everything, but we're tolerant to each other's thinking and integrity. And the first thing is, you have to be able to get the result more than once, and you have to be able to reproduce it if you're offering it clinically. And there are so many slips between the cup and the lip that there need to be, not a lot, but there need to be people like me who on the one hand are deeply into the details, but on the other hand can kind of get up to the 120,000 foot level. And if you want to look over the horizon, we can tell you what the implications are. Right. So um, thank my mother, thank the people who trained me, thank my mentors. But if there are mistakes, they're mine. And I don't claim that everything I say is right, but I can tell you the evidence, I can tell you even the statistics, I used to teach this to doctors, but more importantly, I can tell you what it means, you know, for the next generation, or for your parents, or for you, or for your loved ones, whichever is appropriate. Okay, all right. Now, uh, that's another uh, future podcast that maybe we can do with you, sure. where, where we talk about uh, the holistic approach, some, uh, some, some of the integrative medicine, some acupuncture, Meridian, oh, happy, like happy to do that one. Uh, and by the way, and again, just as an appetizer uh, tickler, I believe that I was the only person invited to the main program of the American Holistic Medical Association at their first meeting and at their last meeting, which was like the 37th or 38th meeting. <laughs> so some of us have been around long enough to know better. We're still excited about the opportunities. But we're also a little more prudent because we've had enough experience that we're not easily um, we're not easily taken in by a good story. Right. You, you can resist shiny object syndrome. Shiny object syndrome. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So we wake up in the morning and uh, we, we urinate and we check our pH. This is the next test, right? Yes, sir. Boy, you're absolutely. So now we've gone through four that have been done on every geographic area and definitely ready as predictive biomarkers. But what about metabolic acidosis at the cellular level? Well, gee, that sounds pretty invasive. No, no. It turns out that after six hours of rest, after six or more hours of rest, the bladder cells, the lining cells of the bladder, equilibrate with the fluid that's in there. It's actually pretty straightforward physical chemistry if you were a physical chemist, which by the way I am. I actually have a PhD in general medical sciences and I went back because someone asked, when was the last time someone else from BU got a, a doctorate in general medical science? I was the last. <laughs> it's, it's now considered to be too much stuff to cover. And me, I thought it was a good beginning. <laughs> okay, so after six hours of rest, the next urine that comes out is equilibrated with those cells, so it's a non-invasive measure of cellular metabolic acidosis. And if I say that in more practical and easy to understand terms, it's a measure of your mineral status, like magnesium and potassium, because you need to have minerals inside the cell in order for the cell battery to work. Of course. And so if the cell doesn't have enough magnesium and potassium inside it, then there's what we call metabolic acidosis. The cell tries to get rid of the acid. The acid gets concentrated in the urine. That's why we measure it in the urine. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by six hours of rest? You can get up and go to the bathroom, but you may not get up and go to the kitchen. And you may not be active. Because during the day, there's a lot of different factors uh, that influence uh, uh, urine pH. But when you're resting and I will say again, you can get out of bed, like to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what your age is. It does matter that you measure the next urine after six hours of rest. Okay. 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 So, um, and, even, and even in infants, if you need to do this, very often you can put the pH strip in the diaper, but at the right time. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. And so these can be done on any age. So I know we're going to talk about levels and, and goal ranges later, but my question was going to be, I think you pretty much just answered it, there's, there's a pH strip that we can get. and Yes, there's an easy way for pennies a day to do this measurement, and it's a very useful tool day by day mm -hmm. to know how much 
beneficial minerals we need to take in from broths and soups and diet and supplements so that on a daily basis we have enough mineral reserves that whatever excess acid needs to be cleared out of our body the kidney doesn't get below six and a half because much below five the kidney would die so the kidney will pull minerals out of cells and out of the bones and out of your joints and out of your blood vessels to protect itself because it wants to live Good for you, kidney. But now our job, is, that was kind of anthropomorphic, but what can I say? But our job is to make sure that there's a reserve in the bones and in the blood vessels and in the joints and in the cells of these minerals. This is one and of the by reasons. the way, and by the way, many, many people are walking around cellularly deficient, not knowing that they are, right. but they are. And good news, it's reversible, but it's reversible in regard to how much deficit you have. So if you have a few hundred milli equivalents, that doesn't take long to correct. But if you have thousands and thousands of milli equivalents of osteopenia and osteoporosis in your bones and uh, metabolic acidosis and the chronic uh, ills that come out of that, it may take months and months of a bunch of not just magnesium, but magnesium in a special form. It turns out when you combine uh, ionized magnesium or soluble magnesium with uh, choline citrate. Mm -hmm. When you take them at the same time, you form a little nano droplet, you form a little tiny, tiny micro droplet, and that's taken up by a different mechanism, even when it's hard to get the magnesium in the body, and then it's chaperoned to the cells, and by the way, the choline is beneficial, and so is the citrate. Such a deal. Oh, yeah. Sounds like a great deal. And yeah, yeah. We're talking about metabolic acidosis here on, on this particular test, and that's something that you're well known for your work with alkaline diet. Your your ebook is the alkaline way, which we're actually doing. The joy, the joy of living the alkaline way, and many uh, colleagues use it with their practice and their clients, uh, and they circle certain pages mm -hmm. that when the person is home, they can look back on and have a reinforcement of the message. So yes, uh, and it brings together. What you eat and drink, think and do. Yes, and we're actually and that's what we start with. We, we've arranged with you to give away a copy of that with every purchase through our website for the next week yep. after this publishes. So, yes, sir. So all of you guys listening, if you buy your goodies at naturalstacks.com this week, you're going to get a copy of that. See, so, such a deal. Yeah. So, okay. is, is that everything we need to cover there? On well, I think that's right. So the urine pH is this non-invasive measure of what's going on inside the cell in regard to metabolic acidosis, but also in regard to the magnesium and potassium that activate the catalysts and help keep the battery charged up. Okay. Right. Now, so now we've done the fifth one, yep. and the sixth is vitamin D. All right. And vitamin D deficiency, at least in North America and Europe, is so common. Yes. That if you literally walk down the street giving vitamin D to everyone you met, <laughs> the country would be better and the cost of care would go down. However, that's not what I'm recommending. I am recommending the correct vitamin D test. This is 25 hydroxy D for those who are technical. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you say vitamin D test to the laboratory today, they know it means 25 hydroxy D. Right. And yes, you can do one hydroxy, you can do 25 hydroxy, and then 125 hydroxy, and you can do three things at very high cost. And in almost all cases, you won't get more information. Okay. So most people need to know their vitamin D, the 25-hydroxy-D, mm -hmm. um, and why? Well, it's, it's called a vitamin, but it's really a neurohormone. So sometimes, even when you get the words right, we confuse you because we say it's a vitamin, but it's not. <laughs> Technically, right. a vitamin is something you need a tiny amount of to activate catalysts in the body, but vitamin D is really a neurohormone. And Dr. Mike Hollick, among others, uh, Dr. Sunshine uh, has mm -hmm. shown uh, that what vitamin D does uh, is it links two cells that have been dividing and it says, thank you, we have enough, stop dividing. If you listen to what I just said, that sounds like part of your anti-cancer mechanism. I noticed that, yeah. I mean, and that's... So, when, so when low vitamin D is present, your risk of cancer is really high. I mean, and when your vitamin D is adequate, your risk of cancer is really low. And right. by the way, just right is just right, not too much, not too little, and 
before we're done, we will talk about the goal value. Yeah. So when you said that, I mean, that's exactly where my mind went because we know cancer is unmitigated cell mutation. So yes, we have other anti-cancer mechanisms that complement, but one of the most important thing is keep the essentials, keep the nutritional essentials, the things that are required that your body can't make, keep them available because von Liebig showed way back when that whatever is least available in a complicated system controls the output and efficiency of the system. So if you need 20 things to build your bones and you're taking in 19 of them, the one you're deficient in, that's the one that's going to control the quality of your bones because right. you need all of them. Why? Don't ask me. That's above my pay grade, but you need them all. <laughs> well, that, that would make the one that's missing the rate-limiting substrate, right? The rate-limiting substrate. They actually named a whole medical school for this guy in Germany. This law of limiting factors is a big deal. And I actually thought I had thought of it, uh, but in, in, whenever you think you have a good idea, look again. Someone in history had it long before <laughs> you did, and we just forgot it. Well, <laughs> and pay them, pay them the homage. And I mean, that's, that's a fairly, uh, you can extrapolate that to, to, to life in general. I mean, you're, you're only as strong as the weakest link in your chain. If you're, if you're deficient yes, in this one thing, it's going yes, to sir. kind of uh, sabotage or, or, or hold up the entire process. Quite right, 100%. That's exactly the point. We're talking about the biomarkers, but I'm trying to interpolate mm -hmm. what to me are important um, they're not just aphorisms, they're principles by which you can live as opposed to die, because there are aphorisms by which you can die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I prefer the ones by which you can live. <laughs> I do too, I do too. So okay. uh, we have two more to go. Okay. One is the omega-3 index. This is relatively recently developed by Professor Bill Harris. But I'm glad to tell you that the omega-3 to 6 ratio is very important. These are essential fats. These are fats we must take in from the outside, we must take in enough of them, and most of us are deficient, and we also damage them, which is not good. And we damage them because we don't have enough minerals and we don't have enough protective antioxidants. And so I'm in favor of having enough protective antioxidants and minerals, and then I'm in favor of making sure that we have a balance of omega-3 to 6. Um, and. Uh, a uh, quick little story, uh, Professor Harris was visiting with my colleague, Professor Doister, uh, and he was lamenting to her that most people have a low ratio, they don't have enough omega-3, and I happened to be sitting there because she and I are colleagues of long standing, and we were going to talk about something later. Anyway, she pointed at me, he took out a lancet, a few days later he called me up and he said, your omega-3 index is 16.3%, I think that's what it was, over 16%. Now, he says that over 8% is really healthy. And I said, gee, is 16% too much? You know, because I want just right. I don't want too much. He said, oh, no, we tested. You are our poster boy. I said, no, I'm your friend. I don't want to be on a poster, but thanks for telling me. Okay, and we'll get back to what the goal value is. But the omega-3 index, I think, is really important because most of us get too much omega-6 right. in our edible oils, and we really, really, really don't get enough omega-3. So when we come back and go through goal values, we'll talk a little bit about strategy for optimizing that as well, right? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. And, and hold me to that. So when we come back, we'll do the goal value. And what is a pearl or two? What is a thought or two of something you can do in case you're not at your goal value and you don't have me talking to you at that point? <laughs> All right. One more. Number eight. Yes. Number eight. The last one. Number eight. And the least commonly known. So this is probably the most unusual to most people. Mm -hmm. It's the 8-oxoguanine. Guanine is, is part of your genetic material, and if it gets oxidized, uh, that's a problem. And so we want to know about oxidative damage in your nucleus. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, if you damage your DNA, then it won't be properly uh, transcribed and translated, and then all sorts of consequences occur, not the least of which is death. Right. So, um, in the general category of uh, wanting to die as late as possible and as young as possible, you would want to know your 8 oxoguanine yeah. because it's the measure of DNA or nuclear oxidative damage. Okay. And at the moment, it's the only one that I know that has been sufficiently validated on different populations. And by the way, all of these predictive biomarkers have to have 
been done on every ethnic group around the world, on every socioeconomic group around the world, and have at least some data, and the top four have a lot of data, about predicting 10 years survival or more. So am I going to live 10 or more years, or am I going to live 10 or more minutes? I'd rather live 10 or more years. <laughs> right. You have a really cool uh, image on the slide that talks about hemoglobin A1C. And I think that one was the one that had the really cool curve. We'll, we'll put a, I'll put that image on the um, Oh, please do. Post. And we've got that for hemoglobin A1C, HSCRP, and homocysteine. Okay. We're developing it for the HSLRA. The other four will take some time. They're right. candidate predictive biomarkers, but they cover the rest of epigenetics. They cover the gotcha. rest of what you need to know for lifestyle. So before we start talking about goal ranges, we'll stick with this, uh, the 8-oxoguanine and oxidative stress. What are some things that contribute to increased stress at the nuclear level? Oh, very good question. There are five categories that contribute, only five, but these categories are toxic metals, solvent residues called volatile organic compounds or VOCs, mm -hmm. Persisting organic pollutants, known as POPs, also known as hormone disruptors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we have to add mold products mm -hmm. and radioisotopes. So this is kind of the category that shows you know, all the things that, that as, as biohackers, we know we want to avoid. All the, the like you said. These are the things, these are the things that damage and use up your protective nutrients. These are things that require us to take in orders of magnitude more antioxidants and minerals in the 21st century than we needed in the 19th century. Why? Because the depletors, those five categories of oxidative stressors, right. those things that throw our allostatic and homeostatic balance off. Oh, it, I want my <laughs> allostatic and homeostatic balance to be on, not off. And this, uh, but these I mean, are the things that deplete us. These are the things that, quote, age us. These are the things yeah. that prevent us from repairing. These are the things that prevent us from dancing at 120. And this could be anything from soil depletion in monocultures to, to the, the pervasive use of Roundup and other pesticides. It's all the chemicals that's in our you know, personal hygiene products. Uh, BPA, they're everywhere. Cans. Right. It, they're, they're everywhere. So this is, these, this is a these are the These are the convenience molecules. This is a quantifiable metric to show, uh, this particular test is a quantifiable metric that, that can show us our exposure to these things. Yes, sir. Very cool. And each of these tests, each of these tests, you could do hundreds of tests in any one of these categories. Mm -hmm. But what, would you, what you would end up with is the same information you get from these eight. So as we've gone around, and I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed if you want to do more complete testing. Right. I'll even help you understand it, because because time variance and circadian rhythms and various other things influence testing. Um, but these eight, um, they add life to years and years to life. Yeah. However, you need to know the goal value and how to get there. Let's do it. All right. So let's go back. Hemoglobin A1C. You want to eat whole foods that you can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without burden. And if it's not whole, you don't need it. And let me give you some examples. Okay. You're sweet enough as you are, you do not need to add sugar. We're now taking in a pound of sugar or more a week, when in grandma and grandpa's time, they were taking in a pound a year. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing that. So we have taken we have taken things that used to be occasional treats. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if once or twice a year you want to have some, shall we say, ice cream, I will celebrate with you. But for me, once a year is probably as, as much as, as I'm really excited about because the next day <laughs> after the ice cream, mm -hmm. I have to be a little more active, I have to be a little more uh, attentive, I don't, I feel a little heavier, I probably have gained a few pounds and I want to get that off because I don't want to keep gaining. Okay, so moving from sugar in food to a stable, healthy blood sugar level in my body mm -hmm. so that my body and brain and nervous system and so forth and digestion can all be nourished 
by a slow level of sugar that provides energy and not an excess of sugar that causes me to put that excess sugar in places it shouldn't be, causing me to not be energetic because this extra sugar is like, let me see what the analogy would be. Imagine that you're a ballet dancer. And then they come in with a costume that weighs 80 pounds. And they say, we want you to do pirouettes and we want you to really, you know, and you're a ballet dancer. And so you want to do all this. Okay. But with that weight, you just can't do it. Well, the extra sugar stuck onto protein becomes like that weight. And it causes your blood vessels to become hardened. That's called atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. It causes your heart to attack you. That's called myocardial infarction. It causes your middle cerebral artery to disconnect, and that's called a stroke. Um, these are not small issues. No, they're not. They're directly related to whether you do or don't have extra sugar stuck onto protein. And this was from Paul Gallup back in 1967, 68. And I was working for one of his protégés, and I remember when Dr. Gallup announced how important this was, and everyone else said, well, prove it. So he did. I'm chuckling. You have such a comical delivery of some of these things. Well, thank you. I think if you can be a little lighthearted about it, but accurate, yeah. it helps people. Right. Because it demystifies at the same time that it says, hey, he's not so stuffy. So where, what kind of numbers do we want to see for A1C? Right, right, right. Thank you. What's the goal value? Less than 5%. So don't look at the lab range that makes you into a statistic. Look at the goal value, it's less than 5%. If your hemoglobin A1C is above 5%, you have too much sugar too much of the time, and I predict it's because of added sugar in your diet, and here's what to do. Eat whole foods. Eat a wide variety of whole foods in a wide variety of ways, and eat them with lots of herbs and seasonings uh, and um, uh, nuts and uh, uh, fruits and uh, simple eat like a peasant feel like a king <laughs> eat like a king die young and suffer it's an old aphorism it's an it old is. English aphorism mm -hmm. eat like a peasant feel like a king I do today I eat what I'm talking about and I feel quite well thank mm -hmm. you very much mm -hmm. and by the way I didn't always feel well but when I've, since I've been doing this, I have felt consistently much better. Yeah. I, I would so have hemoglobin to... A1C less than 5%, stop added sugar, and usually that will help a lot. Often that's all you need to know. But you may need to replenish chromium or vanadium. You may, may need to replenish uh, those essential nutrients that help regulate blood sugar. Uh, but that's where working with either a direct access lab or working with a health professional who we have trained, they'll know about this stuff. So two things that I want to clarify. When you say whole foods, in your mind, you're also meaning non-processed foods, right? So, 100%. Okay. That's exactly right. It, come to my kitchen. You will see a lot of things that are whole, and you will see very thing, very, very few things. At the moment, I can't think of anything that's processed. We actually have very few things in, in cans. Uh, we have things in glass, we have things in ceramic, we have whole staples. Uh, we go to our garden and we pull out some greens and we come in and make a salad. Um, so uh, fortunately, and it is really good fortune on my part, but we've made it a, par a priority to walk this talk. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about fresh from the garden, we mean like we just walked outside and asked what fennel wanted to volunteer today. <laughs> right. And right. if you can't do that, go to the green grocer or, or, or participate in a community supported agriculture yep. CSA yep. and as high quality as possible. If you mm -hmm. can get a biodynamic CSA, better yet. Mm -hmm. uh, or have your own kitchen garden. Uh, there are almost always options, no matter how limited you are, either in resource or space. Uh, my son, who's a permaculture biodynamic food forester, he tells me if you have one square meter of space, you can have a kitchen garden. Yeah. Because you have a volume. You right. Know? right. Okay. And by the way, you won't be growing exotics, but you will be growing staples. And tomatoes, they'll grow almost anywhere. Yes. That's Certain greens, they'll grow almost anywhere. And fresh, guess what? Fresh tastes better.
It does. It certainly does. Not only does it taste better, it is better. <laughs> so I'm the scientist who could bore you with this, with the technical reason why it's better, but the fact that the taste is better is all that most consumers need to know. <laughs> I think I think our audience is uh, we're not most consumers. We want to know the science, but no, no, you do, and we, I'm and I'm and, and I'm you're, not back, you're but, no, you're not. I'm, you're certainly I'm, delivering the parson, right? Now you mentioned not to pay attention to the normal mm -hmm. lab ranges. We've, we've well, if you want to be a statistic, well, if you want to be a statistic, pay attention to the lab range. We've, but last time I checked, people wanted to know something about them, yeah. and the lab range covers. From the sublime to the ridiculous. Well, that's that's my, that was where I was going to go. Is we've talked on this show before with other guests about the difference between being normal and being optimal, and we don't want to fall into that medical category of eh, good enough. You don't have a medical deficiency. We want optimal, and that's where your the ranges you're giving us are in that optimal area. No, no, these 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 goal values are the best outcome optimal values. Perfect. Perfect. Absolutely right. And and I'm in agreement. We no longer need to meet, make people into statistics. Okay. So I had a classmate named Bob Galen. He had a mentor named Ray Gambino. They published a book about 1976 called Beyond Normality about lab ranges. And this was a great advance in the 1970s but it made people compare to a statistical population. And in hindsight, the last time I took care of a statistic was not in this lifetime. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Now I taught statistics. I, you know, <laughs> I'm a recovering uh, professor, uh, but uh, in terms of indiv individualizing or predicting what to do, you really need the goal value, how far you are from the goal value and what to do about that. All right. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So I'm glad that, you know, that you and your community want to know about this stuff because it's the consumers who are going to drive the transition. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And, and I think fortunately we're starting to see that that uh, demand is starting to uh, to drive big change, both in, in health and food industries. No, no, absolutely. And that's the secret. Mm -hmm. The industries, the food industry, the agricultural industry, etc., responds to consumer demand. Mm -hmm. If the consumer wants quality, they'll get quality. Mm -hmm. If the consumer wants quantity, they'll get quantity. Mm -hmm. If the consumer wants to be fooled by elegant marketing about stuff that is crisp and dead and you know nutrient deficient mm -hmm. and imbalanced, oh uh, well, only so long can you carry that charade on. Right. Right. And and for full disclosure, some of my best friends work for Quaker Oats or General Foods or General Mills or ADM or Cargill or whatever. And we, those of us who supposedly know better, and our mothers will tell you that we do, by the way, <laughs> those of us who supposedly know better, we go to the food companies and we tell them that there's a consumer driven health revolution underway and they should participate in it, that people will invest in themselves and their families and their health, especially if they have transparency, especially mm -hmm. if they're informed. And I want you to know that this goes as far back as the early 80s. And in the early 80s, I was told the consumer can always be fooled. And I said, <laughs> even P.T. Barnum knew that that was not true. <laughs> right. Right. And today, consumers are leading mm -hmm. what is truly a transition truly a revolution or an evolution and the more consumers are informed the more they're inspired the more they know that this is relevant to them as individuals the better amen That's good. so let's uh, we could talk about this forever we'll, we'll try to um no, 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 no. We we we've, we've agreed that if you're willing, I will come back and we'll talk about other subjects. But I, today I am we definitely are on a line of march. Yes, I'm definitely willing. Let's let's shelf that right. for for another episode as well. So, inflammation, okay. um, C-reactive protein. Where do we want to be? Right, right, right. So, yeah. So we we we've gotten through the hemoglobin A1C. We know the goal value is less than five percent. And if it's okay, I'm just going to go through all eight and their goal values, yeah. and then we'll come back quickly and look at what to do about it. Okay. So we know for hemoglobin A1C, it's less than 5%. For HSCRP, it's less than 0.5, and it's less than 0.5 milligrams per liter. For homocysteine, it's less than 6, and the units are micromoles per liter. For the lymphocyte response assay, the LRA, 
it's no reactions, you're tolerant. For the first morning urine pH, it's between six and a half and seven and a half. For the vitamin D, it's between 50 and 80 nanograms per milliliter. For the omega-3 index, for the omega-3 index, it's more than 8%. And for the 8-oxoguanine, it's more than 5, and the units are NG per mg creatinine. So it's 5 nanograms for every milligram of creatinine. And when you do a lot of urine tests, you often standardize against creatinine. It's easy and inexpensive to measure. And just for full disclosure, I did develop a more advanced test of kidney function when I was at NIH, but I was recently introduced as the Dr. Jaffe who introduced the creatinine test of kidney function. Okay. Now, the creatinine test was published by a Professor Jaffe <laughs> in 1897. You, you have for aged, full disclosure, you have aged disclosure, well, sir. Yes, for full disclosure, I am old, but I am not that old. <laughs> <laughs> this anti-aging stuff really works. Yes, right, <laughs> but only for Dorian Gray. <laughs> I, I, and I'll just take a moment to say, and again, this could be another whole podcast, I'm actually in favor of graceful aging. I'm in favor of saging. I am thrilled and delighted to be at my age, mm -hmm. and my son who's a lovely 28-year-old, I'm glad he's at his age. But I don't want to be 28 again. I don't. Uh, forgive me for saying that, but I don't. But on the other hand, I want to feel like I'm 30 or 40. Right. And I want to feel like I'm 40 until I'm 120. Right. And you can keep checking back with me every year or two to see how I'm doing. <laughs> but at the moment, thank you, I'm doing okay. Well, we like hearing that. Good. And for the shape I'm in, I'm in good shape. Yeah. So let's uh i guess no no so we got through we got through what we got through the first morning urine ph we got through yep. the vitamin d yep. we got through the omega-3 index which is more than oh no we got through all of them yeah, we, we yeah now we have to go back and say what do you do yeah. with regard to hemoglobin a1c it's eating whole foods that you can digest and easily assimilate and eliminate and no added sugar mm -hmm. and then people ask me what about wine and I say, if you give up dessert, which I have given up easily. Now, what did, what, so let me not say that. What is dessert for me? Dessert is um, fruit, mm -hmm. whole fruit, mm -hmm. uh, berries. Right. The darker the fruit, the ber better. The riper, the better. If you just walked out and picked it off the bush, even better. And by the way, we have berry gills at my home. You, you can come and pick berries with me. Uh, I, I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> no, I hope you do. No, no. These are not idle offers. I believe the best way to learn is by experience. You know, it's nice uh, to have a conversation as we're having, but the best way to learn is from experience. You know, my fiance's uh, sister and her husband run um, Macintosh Fruit Farm in Berryville, which is close to you. You know, Berryville is close to me, mm -hmm. and, and you're a little further south, but you're not far from Floyd. I am not. I'm very close to Floyd. There's a biodynamic, not just a biodynamic teaching center in Floyd, but they provide the biodynamic preparations for my and many home gardeners who want to follow a super organic, a way of feeding the leaves and the roots and the whole plant. It's a philosophy, and it says that if the plant is really healthy, what the plant produces will be really healthy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, another subject for another time, but my asparagus, my little garden asparagus, grow eight feet tall. And on the internet, you will learn that asparagus grow three to four feet tall. <laughs> so I sent a picture to my friends in Germany, because in Germany, asparagus is a big deal. They call it spargel, it's spargel season. Okay. And they, they, they immediately responded, how, how, how wonderful to see such an asparagus, you know. But did I Photoshop it? <laughs> right, and I said, "Oh, good point. Uh, I, I, I'm not sophisticated enough to do that, but right. someone might have. No, no, that's just a picture." And the point is that in a biodynamic food forest, mm -hmm. the average plant grows twice as big, is twice as productive, and is resistant to pests mm -hmm. because it's so healthy. Okay, okay. So, um, we're C-reactive protein. Right, right. C-reactive protein. Okay. What do we do? Well, stop the bad stuff and do more of the good stuff. Stop the inflammation, which is repair deficit, and promote repair. 
And how do we promote repair? Well, we cleanse with a scorbate to get the bad stuff out and uh, top up our antioxidants. We include healthy, safer polyphenolics uh, to make the innate immune system able to repair. We make sure uh, that we have enough of the essential nutrients, the things the body has to take in, mm -hmm. that we get from whole foods mostly, but occasionally from supplements. Mm -hmm. So with regard to CRP, since inflammation is really repair deficit, we evoke healing responses and remove obstacles to recovery. We don't fight with the fire of inflammation. Inflammation is a term from pathology. And I want to know what the physiologic basis is and what to do about the physiology. And it turns out that inflammation is really repair deficit. Inflammation is a pathology term, but repair deficit is a physiology term. And I am a doubly board certified pathologist, and some of my best friends are pathologists. But physiology is where it is clinically. Okay. So we have to first correct our misunderstanding of language and thinking. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes fairly transparent and mm -hmm. straightforward what mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, I really like that explanation. That, that makes a lot of sense. It's easy to understand, and it's easy to see the, the path to optimal when you look at it that way. No, no, thank you. I want you to know it only took me 25 years to develop that explanation. <laughs> well? No, it's really true. And a lot of smarter people have said this. When you really understand something, you can explain it. You can write it on a napkin. And if, right? and if your explanation is complicated, you don't really understand it. Right. You should be able to right. write it on a napkin. That's, that's how I write heard it. Write it on a napkin. Right. Explain it to a barmaid. Whatever. Whatever, you know. <laughs> okay. So, um, let's see. So, um, homocysteine, the next. This we talked about is about methylation, it's about detoxification, it's about sulfur balance. Um, it turns out that many of the toxins bind to the sulfur in our body and th that protects us from the toxin, but it depletes the essential sulfur source. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? GGOBE, garlic, ginger, onions, brassica, sprouts, and eggs. One or more should be a staple in the diet, not a condiment. Doesn't have to be all of them. So I will say garlic, ginger, onions, brassica, sprouts, and eggs, and then people will say to me, I don't like ginger. I said, how about garlic? <laughs> One of the five. <laughs> give, me a, you know, give me a chance here. We have actually quite a bit of diversity. Eggs, mm -hmm. and oh, by the way, if you can get quail, goose, or duck eggs, mm -hmm. they are better. Why? Because the poor chickens, they're in trouble. And, yeah. right, unless you know the chicken, <laughs> you know, be skeptical about the egg. So if we were to eat broccoli sprouts, does that cover broccoli brassica? Sprout. That covers and brassica any sprout. and sprouts. Not any sprouts, specifically broccoli sprouts. And I think his name is Talal. There's a researcher uh, colleague uh, who has made a whole career about showing that specifically broccoli sprouts have many of the things that help protect us in this category and also things that help our anti-cancer mechanisms to stay strong. And by the way, he felt so strongly about this that he started a broccoli sprout business. <laughs> okay. He's still a professor, yeah. but they produce millions and millions of pounds, I believe, of broccoli sprouts distributed through good quality uh, grocery stores. You, you know, you go in the green yeah. part of the grocery store and you look for the sprouts. Yeah. And there's half a dozen of them and you pick the one you like, but I really recommend the broccoli sprouts. We had and and no, I don't I don't have any uh, interest or financial uh, interest in that, uh, but I do think that while sprouts are a good source and you can make them yourself at home, if you're resource limited but have some time and you enjoy this, there's almost nothing that I know of that will build your sense of optimism more than pouring some wet seeds into a little tray and coming back a few days later and having all these big sprouts that are pushing up towards you with great vitality and hopefully good humor. Yeah, and then you eat them. Oh yes, they want to be consumed. That's the amazing part. <laughs> All right. If so, you don't, if you don't consume them, if you don't consume them, they will involute in a very short time and start to smell. They really want to be consumed when they're yeah. fresh. This is two consecutive episodes where we've talked about broccoli sprouts. We had Anne Louise Gittleman on last week, and she mentioned broccoli. She's sprouts. one of my favorite people. She's been around also long enough to know better, but she's she's again she's awesome. A good. She's got yes, and she's 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 got messages that are relatively easy to understand, mm -hmm. but accurate. Mm -hmm. And she delivers them very well. Yes, yes. Okay, so now immune tolerance. 
Right, right. You want to be tolerant to what you consume. You want to be tolerant to the foods, to the air, to the environment, to what you put on yourself in personal care. How do you know? Well, your body can tell us. So if you're perfectly healthy, you probably are tolerant and you probably don't need the test. But if you have any inflammation and repair deficit, if you have any autoimmunity and chronic illness, if you have any degenerative illness, I promise you, your immune defense and repair system is out of whack. Mm -hmm. And we can find out specifically what's burdening the immune system, either T cells or B cells, uh, either type 2 or type 3 or type 4, that includes immune complexes. And the goal value is to be tolerant to everything. Okay. And to have no delayed hypersensitivities, no delayed allergies. Okay. And healthy people, they are tolerant. By healthy, I mean asymptomatic. Right. And in proportion to your symptoms, you will have more reactions. But by the way, out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of substances that we can test, very rarely does a person react to more than a dozen or a dozen and a half. And that's amazing to me because I know a lot of people who tell me they're allergic to the 21st century. And I suggest that if they could, they should live in the 19th century, but they can't do that. And so they better establish some rapport right. or some acceptability in the 21st century. And by the way, that's not easy because there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Yes. We're marinating in toxins that are 100 to 100,000 times more than they used to be. Yes. Stop it. Yes. <laughs> Well, we're we're almost to that one. That's that uh, that'll be number eight. We'll we'll talk we'll talk about how to do that at number eight, right? Right, right. Okay. Okay. So now, first morning, you're in pH. Let's say that your urine is too acid, and you want to protect your kidneys and your cells and your bones and stuff. So now you take uh, mag plus guard and choline citrate, the combination of ionized magnesium like perk mag plus guard and perk choline citrate. And we combined that and developed that and actually patented it globally uh, because we needed a way of enhancing the uptake safely of magnesium and then chaperoning the magnesium to the cells because magnesium is nature's calcium channel blocker. Magnesium is the antioxidant that protects your essential fat from oxidative damage. Magnesium activates your battery in the cell. It does a lot of good things, but it's a hard molecule to get in. It's a hard mineral to get in the body, and it runs out as fast as most people take it in. And we said, no, no, we need to get it in and chaperone the delivery. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Perk Mag Plus Guard and Perk Choline Citrate unique combination comes in. No other choline will do that. Choline by tartrate doesn't do that. Okay. Hmm. It's interesting. Right. And vitamin D. We know the goal value. It's 50 to 80. How do you get there? With drops under the tongue. Why do you take the drops under the tongue? Because millions and millions of Americans, according to my colleague, do not absorb vitamin D from their gut. They have enteropathy. They have atrophy. They have this, that, or the other digestive problems, but they don't absorb vitamin D from their gut. So it doesn't matter how much vitamin D those people take. Very little gets it. A little bit does get it, but not enough. And when you measure their vitamin D level, and people come to me all the time, they say, I'm taking 5,000 units, 10,000 units, 20,000 units, and my vitamin D is deficient. It's 30 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I say drops under the tongue. And I recommend 400 IU per drop. That's for technical regulatory reasons. Mm -hmm. And as many drops as you need to bring your vitamin D level into the 50 to 80 range. Okay. And by the way, the things that you dissolve under the tongue before swallowing go to the brain first and then the body, and that's a good thing. Yes. Okay, okay so that's vitamin D. Omega-3. How much omega-3 do we need? Well, to get your omega-3 index more than 8%, for most people, it's 3 to 6 grams a day. Okay. It must be EPA, DHA, because the precursors don't get converted in people who need it. So 3 to 6 grams a day of EPA, DHA guard is what we recommend. And just to clarify for, for folks listening, the, the precursors being ALA, and that would be more of the... Oh, yes, the precursor is ALA, goals. and really healthy people. And when you find really healthy people, please send them to me because I want to meet them. Uh, really healthy people can convert ALA into EPA and then DHA. But the desaturase system that's required is easily poisoned by all the toxins we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So the very people who need to be able to convert the ALA can't. Right. Or have an inhibition of it. 
So we recommend and urge people to take the proper and active EPA and DHA. Now you need EPA for body and brain, you need DHA for brain and body. You need both. Okay. All right. And only the companies that make one but not the other tell you you need one but not the other. And I'm telling you as a scientist, you need both. <laughs> okay. And you need enough to get over 8%. And so many people today are taking 50 to 100 times. That's the NHANES data, the most recent National Nutrition Survey. So that many millions of Americans are taking in 50 to 100 times more omega-6 and omega-3. And the main culprit of that in our diet is refined vegetable oils, correct? And processed yes, foods? Yes, what, what we call edible oils. Mm -hmm. And what I call inedible. Mm -hmm. In my home, we cook a lot with wine. We cook a lot with vegetable broth. We also have some free-range kosher chicken broth that we occasionally cook with. Oil? No! Almost no human being needs to eat, add oil in their diet. Why? Because there's plenty of fat in the whole foods I eat. I'm not fat deficient. You can look at me, I'm definitely not fat deficient. However, our problem is that the edible oils that are produced en masse, even the better ones, are not good. And by the way, the EVO extra virgin olive oil, go to Tuscany at the time they make extra virgin olive oil in the fall. And what they make, the green, cloudy, d delicious, magnificent, aromatic stuff, if you ask them, where do I buy this? They'll look at you and say, what are you, crazy? We eat this. This is why we're so happy and we live so long. We don't sell this. So what we call extra virgin olive oil, that uh, yellowish, clear uh, material, that's not what I'm talking about. So my suggestion is cook whole foods. And so I'm not a raw food person, although I'm not opposed to that if you have a healthy digestion. But raw foods are hard if you have a weak digestion. And many people need to have rehabilitation before they can consider raw foods. Right. But if you're going to cook foods like I do, cook whole foods, cook them in broth, cook them in wine, cook them in ways that are yummy, cook them with lots of uh, nuts and seeds and lots of herbs and spices, etc. And by the way, fresh spices are better than old spices mm -hmm. because the spices contain a lot of concentrated essential minerals and nutrients in protected ways. They have a lot of antioxidants in protected ways. But as soon as you crush them, then the air, the oxygen, begins to challenge them. So we make our own seeds uh, and spices uh, in a mortar and pestle. Um, we touch our food actually quite a lot. And as a consequence, we're very you know, physical with our food. Mm -hmm. But I find it fun. Right. I, Children also, by the way, they love to, you know, I don't paint my face with the food, but I sometimes, I sometimes eat either with chopsticks or with my fingers in Indian style because it gives me more visceral experience, more sensory experience, more fun. Yeah. And by the way, I do not overeat. I don't because I used to. Okay. And when I overate, I weighed 60 pounds more and I don't want to find that weight again. Right. So, um, uh, for full disclosure, I, I don't think I ate badly. I just ate too much, and I ate at the wrong time. Right. I wouldn't eat early in the day. I would be famished at night. I would eat a fairly large meal, often accompanied by a decent glass of wine, and then I would go to bed, hibernating like a bear. And eventually, not unlike a bear, <laughs> I had fat pads <laughs> that were very respectable. <laughs> okay. And now I have a little bit of fat pad, but not much. And if I gain three pounds, I stop drinking wine because for me, that's the indicator. And it may not be so for other people, but I, I like a glass of wine. I'm of an age. I'm over 40. I think you can have a glass of wine if that's okay with your culture and, and that's okay with your body. Okay. So that's omega-3 index. I think that's right. Yeah. Now we need to do 8-oxoguanine. This yeah. is the one that's the, the, the most unusual of the tests, but it's the one that measures oxidative damage to the nucleus. Now it turns out that ascorbate, vitamin C. Ascorbate protects the nucleus, and it protects the battery, and it protects the cell, and it protects everything else. So you do a C cleanse, okay, and find out how much ascorbate you need based on your oxidative load and damage, and then you take in three quarters of that, or 75 percent, daily, until you do the next cleanse. 
And we actually recommend doing it weekly for a while until you know what your uh, plateau levels are, what your uh, reproducible values are. Um, but it's an amazing way for people at home uh, to find out in a few hours how much ascorbate they need by taking anywhere from a gram and a half to maybe three or six grams or maybe even 12 grams in some extreme cases every 15 minutes. So let's say you're, you have an autoimmune disease or you have some chronic inflammation. You take six grams, which is 6,000 milligrams if you do the math. You take six grams every 15 minutes. That's 24 grams an hour, 48 grams in two hours. Most people will cleanse in that time. Okay. If you go three or four hours at that level and you don't cleanse, at that point, stop, go about your day, come back next week, but in the meantime, call us. Because there are people who need 100 or 200 grams to cleanse, and we can show you how to do it safely, but you have to have the right balance of fluid mm -hmm. and ascorbate mm -hmm. to meet your needs. And I will throw in the following point. Biology is not linear. So if you take in half of what you need, you get maybe a quarter of the benefit. Mm -hmm. It's the last... 20-25% of what you need that gives you a very strong synergy mm -hmm. of benefits. Mm -hmm. So we want you to have as much antioxidant protection as your nucleus needs. Ascorbate is your friend in this regard and a C cleanse is how to find out how much you need. So the, the lower the intake or the faster you cleanse, the less of that oxidative stress you have. That's right. Healthy people, asymptomatic people, they cleanse on less than four grams. Okay. Minimally, sympt minimally symptomatic people cleanse on four to ten grams. Average people cl cleanse between ten and 120 grams. And then there are a few people that need more than 120 grams. And those are the ones that we want to help because that's a lot. Right. But there are people who had, uh, I'm thinking of one, this is a nurse up in Alaska, she had psoriatic arthritis for 28 years, and the first time she was out of pain in all that time was when she did the C-cleanse, but it took her 320 grams. That's a lot. Oh, wow. that's over half a pound. Oh, dear. I said, why did you persevere? She said, doctor, I'm a nurse. I've been in pain for all those decades. This took me out of pain. I persevered. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Dr. Jaffe, we have gone, looks like, about well over an hour. So I think... We did. I, I apologize for going long, but thank no. you for, for wanting it to be clear. I, I thank you for, for staying with us and, and giving us all this information. Um, we've got a lot for our listeners here to enjoy. We've got a lot that we can come back and cover on future podcasts, if you're willing. Good. Um, before we let you go, where can our listeners get more of you? Or find oh, your... oh, thank you. No, thank you. One of the things they can do is just do a search online for my name, Russell Jaffe, mm -hmm. and then go to video because there are podcasts and YouTube videos and various other presentations I've made. Now, for forewarning, most of them are a bit technical because most of them were actually delivered to medical societies or technical and scientific groups. And some of them, the ones more often watched, are like this. Um, Content rich, it's my goal to be uh, accurate about content, but also it's a conversation. Okay. And uh, over the next few months, um, in process, uh, we currently have over a dozen videos that will be posted on different subjects. Uh, what we did this past weekend, we filmed, and that will be up as 10, 30 minute videos with little two or three minute appetizers. As soon as the editors can get to them, that shouldn't take too long. Um, so, uh, thanks for asking, but in addition, uh, if anyone wants technical information, uh, they can get that either through ELISA Act Biotechnologies, which is a toll-free number that we gave before, but I'll give it again, and it's 800-553-5472 or www.elisaact.com, elisaact.com, that's the website. Or you can contact, uh, contact us through Perk Integrative Health, and the uh, Perk Integrative Health toll-free number is 1-800-553-5472. Actually, I gave those backwards, but it doesn't matter. The customer service people will be happy to help you <laughs> any, any way you reach us, online, 
uh, <laughs> et cetera. And, I've, been, I've been giving out these numbers for, for, for too many years. <laughs> we'll have links for all you guys listening on the, yes, uh, thank you. On the blog post. So <laughs> yes. go, go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see the video version thank of this you. as well as uh, one-click links to, to all of this stuff. So There um, we go. That's well, the way. One more question for you, Dr. Jaffe. Your top three tips to live optimal. Oh, very good question. My top three tips. First of all, don't worry, be happy, and listen to Bobby McFerrin. Sure. Secondly, stay hydrated. There are a lot of things in life that are good for you, but they dehydrate you, including a glass of wine. And you can have the wine if you have the water. So water is your beverage of choice. So that's my second tip. Third tip, live in harmony with your nature. Now, that's a trick because you have to know your nature in order to live in harmony with it. But if you can get to know your nature, it will help you live in harmony with it. And otherwise, it's going to fight with you. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Mel Brooks, the 2,000-year-old man, will tell you don't do that. That's very, very well said. So for all you guys listening, thanks for tuning in. Make sure you go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see the video version of this along with the links that we talked about. And remember... Every purchase this week is going to include a copy of Dr. Jaffe's The Joy of the Alkaline Way, Living the Alkaline Way. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will talk to you guys next week. Natural Stack. Start optimizing your mental and physical performance. Optimize yourself.